Talent speaks for itself. As an entrepreneur, if you are able to identify a unique market gap, come up with a simple, smart and effective solution for it, you can build a business that gets into the Y Combinator, which is like the mecca of the startup world. Such is the talent of Shruti Kapoor, who is my guest for ASFA's podcast today. Shruti is the CEO and founder of Wingman. Wingman is an AI-driven sales tool that records, transcribes and analyzes sales calls in the real time for a seller. It gives them insights on how to improve their calls and their outcome and also provides on-the-go sales coaching. Isn't that amazing? So jump with me into this lovely conversation with Shruti. But before that, let me remind you of a to-do when you finish listening to this episode. Your to-do is to leave a 5-star review on Apple iTunes or on your podcast listening app because your review will help this podcast reach many more women entrepreneurs just like yourself, helping them sell more and grow more. So please show us some love and leave a 5-star review for this podcast. And now, let's meet our guest for the day. Fall in love with selling as you acquire the right mindset, selling style and sales process that helps you take your business solution to more prospects, potential clients and the world at large. If you are a women entrepreneur who is looking to get more sales, scale and sustainability in your business, you have reached the right place. I'm Roshni Baronia, your host for the show Ace the Sales, which is all about helping you bring your authentic and influential self to each sales conversation. Hey Shruti, welcome to Ace the Sales Podcast. Hi Roshni, glad to be here. So Shruti, from uh, doing BSc in Life Sciences from National University of Singapore to doing MBA from IIM Ahmedabad to being a startup founder in Y Combinator. Please tell us about this exciting journey that led you to entrepreneurship and how did you land up making a sales tech tool like Finman? Sure, I think uh, you know every business has uh, a journey that revolves around the experiences that the founders have and that gets them to do what they decide to do. Uh, for me, of course, it was uh, kind of, uh, you know, a journey with uh, many turns, uh, I would like to say. All right. So I, after my uh, life sciences, uh, you know, broadly, I was very interested in technology, right? And my life sciences degree was, um, you know, in computational sciences and life sciences. I'd also been exposed to tech um, and one thing that I realized that journey was that, uh, you know, like while technology really excited me, what I wanted to do was to maybe understand a little bit more about how it was applied in real world. Um, and, you know, how do you take it, something from being in the lab as being an experiment uh, to being a product in the market. And uh, so that's kind of where uh, after uh, my MBA, I worked uh, for a long time with a fund called uh, Intellectual Ventures uh, Invention Development Fund, where we were working with university researchers. Uh, you know, in India, we were working with some of the main institutes like the IITs, uh, uh, central universities, etc. Um, and we were working with their researchers. And the idea was that, uh, you know, if you're able to take some of these things that are just sitting in the lab, it does two things, right? One is it ideally really motivates uh, every, um, you know, every kid who's just out there who's now able to see, oh, you know, this technology from the lab made its way here, uh, right? And secondly, it, of course, also then uh, focuses, uh, you know, the researchers to do more research that is more practically applicable, right? Otherwise, what happens is that, uh, you know, professors have only that much time. They spend a lot more time just doing the day-to-day stuff. Um, and so that was kind of the idea behind it. And of course, you know, there was a commercial intent as well. Uh, and I did that for eight years. So it was a, a very interesting journey for me. Um, I, you know, personally was able to bring a few of those products from labs into the market, uh, working with companies and trying to align like the company and the academia together uh, to take these things forward. Uh, and through that journey, of course, as I saw some of these things go, you know, there's always that fascination and, you know, while you're trying to coordinate with so many people, there are some uh, kind of frustrations on, you know, how fast you would want things to be, etc. Uh, I always felt that I wanted to do that too. Uh, and I thought that maybe I would want to do my own startup to, uh, you know, take some of my own ideas uh, and bring them to the market. And that's kind of where that motivation started. So, yeah, you clearly saw a gap from uh, the lab to the business to the actual 
playground of how products work in the market. So that was the gap that you were trying to fill. But uh, but tell me this this entire move from uh, the nine to five hamster wheel to being an entrepreneur. You were wearing the seller hat in your business, right? So for every business owner, they are the first salespeople in their own business. <laughs> <laughs> so coming from a, a research background and uh, working with uh, the brains of the world, how easy or difficult it was for you to get the first few customers for yourself? What were your top three learnings? Yeah, so I think uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when uh, you're kind of in the creator mode, uh, right? Very often you think that your job is to create something and then uh, you hope that, you know, whatever it is that you're creating, whether that's, you know, a product or a service or, uh, you know, like even like a small item in the household, uh, you you hope that somewhere that item, uh, you know, speaks for itself and, you know, people start buying it. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen, right? You still have to be the mouthpiece uh, for all of those things. Uh, and for me, I had uh, experienced that, uh, you know, at different levels, right? Like when I, of course, started talking to researchers, I was realizing, you know, why some of those people were not uh, trying to take the products to market, right? Like they also felt that, oh, if I create something great, you know, it should automatically find its way there, uh, right? And there's always that hesitation. And I think also culturally, we somehow feel that, uh, you know, blowing your own horn is not considered great, right? So you ideally want to just, uh, you know, create something good, take a step back and like, you know, let that shine. Um, so when I switched uh, into my own entrepreneur uh, journey, um, you know, it was kind of interesting because one was I was making a product for sales teams, uh, right? So I was talking to a lot of sales uh, leaders and uh, I, of course, realized, uh, you know, what it took to be a sales leader. And I think some of those prejudices that we have, you know, when you don't know somebody from a certain field, uh, right, those uh, began to break down for me, uh, right? Because I realized that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, not everybody is trying to like fraud you into something, right? Like a lot of times people are actually uh, trying to help, uh, you know, solve a problem, right? And that's kind of one way to think about sales. So that's that was, I think, one big turning point for me uh, to go from thinking about sales as something that is maybe not so desirable or, you know, something that may, sometimes people think of as fake or, uh, you know, like uh, uh, too ostentatious, uh, to saying that actually, you know what, this is very simply helping somebody solve a problem. And in my case, I was like, you know, I really want to solve this problem of uh, salespeople struggling with, you know, having to enter all this data manually, remember things and you know while they're also trying to sell and meet their quota uh, and then my motivation simply became that listen I just want to help salespeople do their job well uh, you know maybe reduce some of that stress that they experience reduce uh, some of the negative things that exist with the job uh, and so if I'm if I can genuinely help people uh, you know get better at that then that's great. And it's, it's, it's not going to happen with them, you know, somehow discovering my product. And therefore, I have to go out there and talk about it. Uh, and then going from, you know, that evangelization mode to actually selling is also a different thing, right? Because it's easy to uh, say that, okay, you know what, I will just talk about my product and I love it and how great it is. Uh, but, you know, slowly you also have to realize that People don't care about what you care about. People care about what their problems are. And so, uh, you you know, today when we are doing anything in the company, uh, the first thing I ask them is like, why should your customer care about this? All right. Like whether you're writing a simple blog post or a post on LinkedIn or you're making some part of the product. Uh, and so I think that is very important. Uh, right. And that helped us get our first 10 customers where I would, uh, you know, go and ask people like, okay, what are some of your problems? How are you trying to solve them? And then try to put the product in the context of that problem, uh, rather than saying that, hey, these are the five great things the product can do. Now go and use it uh, however you would want. Yeah, that, that's so important that uh, business owners are so much in love with their product or the service or the whatever solution that they have created, that they forget actually what the problem for the customer is. Because everyone in the world loves just themselves. They just want to know how anything or everything can help them. But yeah, that's a great point that you've made that uh, move from just loving your product to actually selling it. Yeah, yeah. 
if you go back in time, uh, are there any things in the, your business uh, which you would like to do differently as a first time salesperson for your own business, not for anyone else's, but your own? Yeah, so I think uh, you know a few mistakes that we made uh, right early on. One of the things that I would that we did was while well, we spoke to a lot of people who we thought uh, you know could be possible users for the product, right? And we then of course were in a hurry to start building the product for all those different people, right? Uh, one thing that uh, I would do differently is to say that okay, you know what bucket the different types of users that I've come across, and then decide what is the one specific bucket that I want to build the product for, right? Like in our case, uh, you know, we could have built the product for, you know, a call center uh, provider, or we could have built it for, you know, somebody doing B2B sales for, you know, maybe $100,000 plus in deal values, or we could have built it for like a small business owner, uh, right? Um, And there was a geographic distinction, right? So while we tried to bucket and pick some of these, uh, you know, we, we could have gone a little bit deeper. Like uh, one of the things that we realized was we wanted to focus on the U.S. market. Uh, but a lot of the early explorations that we did were with, you know, businesses in India. And uh, then, you know, you get some feedback, but not all of that feedback is uh, necessarily relevant. And what that does is it just prolongs your cycle uh, of, uh, you know, finding the right product market fit. Um, that was one thing. And the second thing was, uh, to really appreciate uh, the way people are currently doing things, right? Uh, and really understand how people are doing things. Because when we try to solve the problem, uh, you know, we always have a point of view on, hey, you know what, I think this is wrong or this is broken and this is how my product is going to fix it. Uh, but what we don't realize is, you know, what is the exact workflow that somebody does this today? Or if somebody has already tried to solve the problem, uh, you know, hack it together somehow, uh, then to think more deeply about, you know, what part of the problem is still unsolved for them, because that gives you a lot of focus on saying, what should that initial version of my product be able to do, All right? Because otherwise you have two options. What will happen is either you will build too much of your product before you feel that it's ready for the market. Uh, And in which case, uh, you know, you're going to just invest so much time and money and not know whether you're going in the right direction. Or you will build something and it will not be exciting for anyone because maybe that part of the problem they're already solving somehow, right? And you will say that, you know, I've only built part one and it's a five-part product and, you know, I will build four other parts. But you will get feedback only on part one from your users. Um, So it's kind of important to go narrow and go deep uh, early on. That's some uh, great advice that, uh, yeah, don't uh, right away go into building a white elephant in your business and then don't know what to do with it. And also that uh, customer segmentation and uh, bucketing whom you are targeting is very important because then I I think it uh, streamlines the entire communication and the niche and the pipeline building that you do in your business, right? Exactly. So, yeah, one thing that we learned constantly was just you know, less is more in so many ways. Uh, And I still kind of struggle with that, right? Like even when today somebody asked me like, hey, you know, we can be doing A, B or C, what should we pick? And, you know, your first answer is, oh, if I can do A, B and C, then, you know, I can be so much bigger. Uh, But it's so important to, uh, you know, be very disciplined about making that choice. Oh, I love that. Less is more. That's my mantra for 2022, actually. Less is more. (laughs) (laughs) So um, one interesting thing I noticed on Wingman's website uh, also, Shruti, that uh, you claim to do a seven-minute discovery call in which you are able to tell whether or not you can help a prospect solve their particular challenge or not. So I'm curious to know, how are you doing a seven-minute sales call for Wingman? What goes inside it? (laughs) Um, So I think, uh, you know, the first part of it is just, having a dedicated time for discovery, uh, right? And I think that's that's the first lesson that we are trying to get across, uh, right? And uh, otherwise, what happens is the same thing that I described, uh, right? Which is your salesperson is also most familiar with the product, right? And that is kind of their comfort zone, uh, right? Uh, and therefore, when uh, that is their comfort zone, they get into a call, they're most likely to go and say, hello, hey, you know, this is your name, this is my name, 
do the introduction and then jump into saying, okay, I'm here to show you what Wingman does and you know, spend the next 30 minutes talking about it. Uh, right? And the reason why uh, that discovery part is important and why we've kind of tried to limit it to a certain time period and uh, is uh, two things, right? One is you want the salesperson to spend time listening to the customer so that when uh, they understand what the customer's problems are, uh, they're offering a solution. They're not offering a tool. Right. It's like telling somebody, hey, here is a hammer. Now, you know, you can do whatever you want with it versus saying, OK, you know, you want to put a nail in this type of a wall. You should buy this type of a hammer and this type of a nail and then telling them how to use the hammer. Right. Uh, so that's kind of the distinction there. Uh, anybody, you know, like if you think of your product as a hammer, then, you know, anybody can go and purchase a hammer from a hardware shop, but not everybody will then be able to make the right type of hole. Right? And you have to realize that what people are interested in is not buying that hammer. They are interested in making that hole in the wall that is solving a problem for them. Uh, right? So that is kind of the reason for that discovery call. Uh, but we also understand that, you know, especially in uh, the SaaS space, you know, the person you're selling to is constrained on time. I don't want to spend, you know, uh, one hour just talking about my problems uh, and getting on multiple calls, right? I want my problem solved quickly. And therefore, it's important that the questions that the salesperson asks are very pointed and they understand how do I quickly get the needs out of this person, right? Now, uh, which is where the less is more also helps. If you're very focused on, uh, you know, who you're selling the product to, your salespeople already have a lot of, understanding of what are the general problems, uh, right? So when they get on that call and uh, somebody tells us, uh, you know, the, the main purpose of that discovery is just to understand what is the biggest problem and why do they want to solve that problem with a product, right? Uh, and very often we ask people challenging questions like, okay, so, you know, somebody tells us for our product, hey, I want to buy the product because I want all my calls recorded. And we'll be like, okay, but, you know, Zoom has the recording option. Why don't you just record your calls on Zoom? And the reason for us for challenging them is to make sure that they understand exactly what uh, you know they are not able to solve today, uh, and what is the problem if they then go back to uh, doing it another way. Uh, because the other thing that you don't want is somebody to say that hey, you know what, I want to buy a rocket ship for doing something which is much simpler. All right. Uh, if they want to buy a rocket ship, they should be very clear that the rocket ship is the only thing that can solve their problem for them. Um, so uh, the other objective of the discovery is also disqualifying people, right? So people who you don't think are the right users, uh, right? If you can tell them early on that, listen, I don't think this product is for you. Uh, if you're just looking to say record a podcast then you know, Wingman is not the tool you should be using, then that is perfectly fine. It saves you a lot of time. It saves them a lot of time. And then you make sure that the people who start using the product are uh, you know the right users for you and they are happy with the product those are some great tips challenge your buyer as to why they need the product or the solution and in a way you are actually qualifying the right buyer or the client for yourself also it will save you so much time effort and resources by not working with the misfit Shruti, you came up with a solution uh, in the form of a tech tool which is the wingman to help salespeople get on the go coaching and call support. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of sales coaching? Yeah, actually, this is uh, kind of, uh, you know, my favorite part of uh, doing a startup, right, which is just getting so deeply into a problem. Um, and when I started, you know, first thinking about the product uh, and, you know, the idea for the product came because of my own pain points uh, while working at Pioneer. Uh, when I started talking to different people to ask them, you know, do you also face this problem? And I would ask them, you know, how would you justify buying a product that solves this problem for you? Uh, the problem that came up most often was uh, people would say, listen, you know, I have say 10 people or 20 people in my sales team, uh, but you know, if the bottom person is doing, uh, you know, $100 uh, dollars in revenue, you know, the top person is doing like $500 dollars in revenue. And what I want to be able to do is to make sure that all of the people are able to, you know, perform at a consistent level, right? And so that is really the power of sales coaching. How do I get everybody in my team 
to have a good performance right like how do i reduce the disparity of somebody only doing 100 dollars versus somebody doing 500 dollars now today the way a manager does it is to say that okay you know what uh, suppose roshni is doing really well and uh, sanjana is not doing so well i will go and i will constantly talk to sanjana and say okay you know what these are the deals in your pipeline why did you lose this you know what can we do to save the deal right but what gets missed is one roshni doesn't get any feedback on what she could be doing better uh, right and if you don't go and give feedback to roshni she will probably feel demotivated after a while she'll be like you know, there's nothing more for me to learn here let me go and do something else uh, right uh, so that is one is that your best performers will stop performing or they'll stop being motivated or they will churn because they also want some change and they want some improvement right the second thing that will happen is that you are actually not helping sanjana because you don't know what she is doing in those calls that is not converting right and ideally what you want is sanjana to be able to learn from roshni to say oh i see now you know roshni talks about pricing like this and maybe that works for her customers uh, right so now you're also missing out on helping sanjana improve because you are only able to look at very high level things with her uh, and say that oh you know can you send more emails to this person uh, can you uh, you know make sure that you don't talk about pricing at all uh, right which are in, in essentially not having the impact that you want so that is kind of the power of sales coaching right how do you make sure that your top performers stay with you and they continue to grow and how do you make sure that you're helping the rest of the pack move towards the performance of your top performers right so actually going uh, inside the calls and understanding where the person is getting stuck uh, what actually is the area of sales because sales has so many uh, nuances to it but what exactly is the conversation that they are getting stuck is it the negotiation is it the pricing it is just uh, making the first conversation is it the discovery call so what part uh, the person is facing problem with and then addressing that particular problem and bridging the gap so um talking about sales coaching um uh, should be what are some key benefits you have noticed in your journey personally as an entrepreneur as a leader as a founder of women uh, what are the benefits of uh, sales coaching for any person be it a sales leader be it a sales rep be it a business owner yeah so i think uh, depending on the scale and size of your business uh, right the objectives that you should look to get from sales coaching uh, should be somewhat different right uh, i think as a, um, you know even as a solopreneur or as a early um, you know like a person with maybe just a two three member team uh, right the importance of sales coaching uh, often is just in thinking more deeply about the problems of the uh, prospect and iterating on the pitch iterating on the product itself right where you want to say that oh the customer said this maybe that is how i should also talk about my product or maybe the customer said this and therefore maybe i should go and build this feature first before i build the rest of it right um so in that sense sales coaching uh, is about also observing uh, right what the customer is saying because when you are having that conversation you don't have much time to observe right you are just trying to react um so the ability to you know sit back and rethink that and that's kind of what having a tool that allows you to record and then play those back and make comments on it helps to uh when you are trying to scale the team the importance of sales coaching is in uh you know how do i onboard my new reps quickly and what is a pitch that works for different types of people right uh, and this is not just different types of prospects but also different team members um see very often a mistake that a founder makes is uh they when they hire their first few sales people they want the sales people to sell the way they were selling the product right but as a founder you can sell the product a certain way because you feel and think about the product that way uh, but you know when you try and get a sales person to sell the product they can't sell it the same way right so each person also needs to position and be able to talk about it with a little bit of leeway based on their own style or their own background Uh, right so, uh, so and then of course it the, enhances and brings out the strength of that person exactly um and then you know once you are at a much larger scale the uh, you know the importance of sales coaching is trying to get that consistency uh, right where you are like okay you know 
today if i have 20 people uh, and i hire 20 more people this year then i want to make sure that you know my revenue also doubles uh, right um, and that doesn't always happen because when you go from 20 people and you hire another 20 people you know you'll have more variability in people's performance you know uh, and that is kind of uh, the importance of sales coaching then and making sure that you are then driving a more consistent message. You have a much better tested out playbook uh, where you know exactly what is the message that works for a particular segment. How do I pitch this right? What are the questions I need to ask? So all of that uh, then goes into a playbook and then you should start to coach people on that playbook, uh, right? So you should no longer be coaching people just on, hey, you know, this is why you lost this deal. It should be much more about saying, hey, you know what, these are the five things that you should be doing at, with every deal in this stage. And I think you missed out doing this and this is the lesson. So in a way, it uh, while on one hand, it appreciates the diversity and differences in individuals who are the salespeople, but it also brings in alignment uh, in the communication and the pitch that they are making to the client because after all, they are representing one particular brand and there has to be synergy amongst everyone and every communication that goes out, right? Yeah, great. Exactly. Um, so the concluding question I would like to ask you, uh, Shruti, not just as an entrepreneur, but as a woman entrepreneur, because uh, I feel that we need to put the spotlight on women role models like yourself. So uh, what, according to you, will help women entrepreneurs especially embrace selling? Sure. Um, so I think, uh, you know, some of the lessons are, of course, common, uh, right? Uh, and I think some of the lessons are uh, maybe a little bit more uh, women specific, right? Um, I think what is common is that, you know, you have to think about sales as solving a problem for somebody, uh, right? Um, and I think what is maybe a thing that is specific is just in terms of uh, you know how women usually view uh, we view ourselves, right? Like we like to second guess, we like to be a little bit more in the background generally, uh, right? And those are things that when you are starting your own business, you have to uh, kind of force yourself to get out of, right? Um, like I think one thing that I uh, constantly realize and struggle with is, uh, and it's it's more just something to observe is that, you know when you are starting your own business it's not about the product that you make like you are part of that product and the product is the brand that you're trying to create and you are the biggest part of that brand right because early on the brand is you and you have to be willing to go out there and be the spokesperson and the representative for the brand right it's it's you know even beyond just the sales part of it um, and therefore, uh, you know, it's important to also spend some time just getting to know yourself, right? What are your strengths? How do you view yourself? Because all of that is going to come out, you know, uh, whether or not you like it, uh, when you start to position and talk more publicly and, um, you know, be out there. Um, so I think it's important to become much more self-aware right in that journey and to accept the fact that listen i can't hire a social media agency to do social media right i am part of the brand and therefore i have to be willing to define who i am and therefore you know how does that reflect in the brand and everything else that happens around it um and i think that a lot of times uh, women um, maybe uh, you know are more hesitant to do that uh, right uh, and the second part is uh, in terms of being uh, willing to ask for help uh, right um and what we do is uh, you know I think broadly people fall into two buckets, right? One is they will either be uh, like, you know, they're okay to ask people for help, but they don't necessarily know what is the help that they're looking for, all right? Or uh, they feel that, you know, I need to figure all of this out myself. And then I, you know, even if I am asking somebody for help, it's because of a failure and I have not been able to figure all this out, right? But there's a nice balance there, right? Uh, and I think the way to think about that balance is that, listen, there is only this much that research can tell me, right? And then part of my research has to be in terms of talking to people, all right? So go do your research, but then have specific questions that you want to ask people and be very clear about who you want to ask what, all right? Uh, so today, for example, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, one of the things that, 
you will constantly encounter is you'll want to set up a new function, right? Or you want to hire somebody for a role for the first time. And you might not have done the role before and you might not have hired for that role before and you might not have written a job description for that role, uh, right? Now, when you start on that journey, it's important to, of course, go and do the research, right? You can go read 20 job descriptions. You can try to look up people on LinkedIn uh, who are doing that role. Uh, but after that, you know, it's also important to go and speak to people who've been in that role and who've hired for that role so that you can get that first hand information. Right. Uh, and defining every problem and saying that, you know, this is where I will get help from people because they have done this before so that I don't make the same mistakes. And looking at it that way rather than looking at it as, oh, I will not ask people for help because then that is a failure uh, and I look stupid. Yeah, exactly. That that's a huge problem with women, and I think a lot many people also they, they don't have the willingness to ask. However, we also are in a digital age where accessibility is huge. You can go out there and ask mentors, ask for help, reach out to anyone, but still there is this internal inhibition which stops people from asking. And another point that you. Uh, very well made that uh, be specific about what you are asking, what help you need, be specific about that. So uh, yes, Shruti, thank you so much for doing this conversation with us. I'm sure the listeners had uh, some great takeaways from your journeys uh, and your sharings about what you are doing in your business. Thank you so much. Thanks, Roshni. It was fun talking to you.